Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're going to uh, have a discussion of symbolism in painting today. We uh, went into it rather extensively with Paul Cezanne last time, uh, not last time, but uh, several shows ago. And I thought it might be helpful to discuss what symbolism is and how one develops a feeling for it. Um, I had best make clear that when I talk about symbolism, we're not going to be talking about sort of a standard iconography of, of symbols that have been uh, developed over the, uh, the centuries. That a dog, for example, means faithfulness. A uh, you know the halo, holiness. The cross obviously is a symbol for Christ and the crucifixion. A uh, a, a lamp or a, a candle flame is symbolic of human consciousness, uh, perhaps, or enlightenment. You know, a, f a light can mean enlightenment, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we're talking about symbolism in terms of artist sensitivity, a certain uh, creative poetry, a certain emotionalism, a certain expressiveness that will find its way into an artist's work, uh, perhaps really almost unconsciously. Now, all great art doesn't have to be symbolic, but much great art is. A very, very capable piece of painting uh, can have a great deal of value without being symbolic. Perhaps we can go to the first picture, and uh, we'll, we'll get a feeling for it. And <clears throat> as it happens, perhaps we can close in on a little bit, and we don't need to show the border. We can show more of the painting. We, we are coming back to a Cezanne. We'll take a look at one Cezanne. And, uh, and the point to make with this is, what is symbolic about this picture? In looking at it, uh, how does one become aware of symbolism or meaning and emotional expressiveness or a personal poetry or a personal uh, significance? Uh, I think one develops a sensitivity to art by looking at it over the years, and gradually one begins to realize, uh, one begins to almost get it by osmosis. It's, it's really sort of an unspoken language. Once you get it, you don't have it every day. It ebbs and flows the way uh, you'll have energy one day and strength one day and you won't have any the next day. A batter hits four home runs that one day and strikes out three times the next day. It's just uh, part of the rhythm of life and you can't really depend on it. So sometimes I'm on a limb. I've, I've got a program I'm going to do and all of a sudden I've lost my feel for the paintings, feel for the art. But if we go back to the Cezanne and we talk about the symbolism of it, whenever you see something <clears throat> isolated, the way that building is in the trees, it's going to suggest a certain feeling of loneliness. Uh, probably the artist has identified with, if there's a single object in the picture uh, that seems to dominate the picture by its singleness, if we can say that, the artist has identified by that. Okay, so we look at that single building in the background and we say, that is Paul Cezanne. Now what is he doing? Is he standing out with his chest thrown forward with a great deal of, of uh, savoir faire and the uh, uh, man uh, of the world control of himself? No, he isn't. He's pulled back. He's hidden, in a sense, behind the brambles of those stickery limbs of the trees so that there's a whole feeling, a sense of withdrawal, of a certain sense of fear involved in this picture. And it ties in with Cezanne's whole life of uh, fighting to express himself, to find himself, to find his place in society as an acceptable painter. So keep in mind that single isolated object, the stickery quality of the trees, the hiding of it, the, it, he wants to come forward and of course he appears through that little hole but he hides at the same time. Okay, let's go to the next picture. <clears throat> We're going to see what probably would be called a contemporary sculpture, although I don't think it has sculptural values. Uh, and frankly, I've forgotten the artist's name. <laughs> uh, forgive me, you'll probably recognize it. He deals mostly in photographic images, I think, these days. I, uh, I don't think he's a significant artist. Uh, I think we can move in, feel free to move in closer, you know, even while the picture's, picture's on. Uh, you know, we can track the camera in even closer if we have to, but it, we'll, we'll, t we'll take it as best we can. Uh, what does this have in common with Cezanne? Why do I put it next? Well, if we can see in that little box, that stickery little box covered with straight pins and needles, 
is the equivalent of those stickery trees. Inside is a bird uh, hiding inside there out of fear. You know, obviously, obviously this is a response to 20th century technology and the, the threat and fear of the 20th century. The tangle coming beneath can be uh, a suggestion, you know, it's yarn or rope or whatever it is, suggests uh, the tumbling straw from a nest, but also a certain sense of confusion, you know, that through the protectiveness of the box, the little bird, us, the artist, tries to rise above the confusion. So it's very, very close, except that Cezanne is a work of art. I don't believe this will have lasting quality, even though it does have a symbolic uh, aspect to it. It's also how you do it, how you make it, what, as well as what you're trying to express. Okay, we'll go to the next picture. In this picture by Edward Hopper, early Sunday morning, very familiar to many people, and perhaps we've discussed it briefly in other aspects uh, on the program, earlier programs, an artist and critic. This has a symbolic quality to it. What is the symbolic quality? Now, I'm using symbolism almost uh, interchangeably with the idea of content. Content means the emotional uh, expression or the poetical expression, the meaning of a picture, the emotional meaning or the idea of a picture. What does this have in common with Suzanne or the bird? Well, I think there's a certain sense of loneliness in Hopper, of isolation, of withdrawal, the windows are like eyes, the doors like mouths, and there's a whole feeling about the picture of melancholy and loneliness which reflects Hopper. In a sense, those rows of building, buildings are Hopper. And the more you look at paintings, the more you open yourself to them. Of course, the best way to look at a picture is just standing there, gate mouth before, and let it sink in. Don't use the mind. Don't think. Just look, let it soak in, let color sink in, let shape sink in, let design sink in, let feeling sink in, and you've got a picture. And the longer you look at it, the more you have, the more understanding you have. Okay, well, let's go to the next picture. <clears throat> now, it is, it, the, the symbolic quality of a picture depends upon the depth of the artist's involvement, the, the how he paints his picture, with what uh, talent, if we want to use that word, but with what commitment in terms of forms, in terms of the paint, and the sensitivity that he uses in it, uh, as well as the depth of the artist himself. Let's go to this picture. And I believe his name is John Karsman. I could be wrong. Uh, a contemporary painter. A and we see this picture postcard, paint by numbers approach to art that is so fashionable today, so superficial, so shallow, but mm, God, so fashionable. And because it is the surface feeling, uh, we have a similar quality of relationship of trees to the house. Uh, the house hiding behind the trees, some of the windows, particularly in the front under the uh, triangular uh, gable, I guess they're called, uh, could be s seen as eyes. But because the artist doesn't have depth to himself or hasn't allowed it to show in his picture, the superficial handling of it, this paint by numbers quality, uh, the picture never rises to the level of art, much less that of symbolism. So it, it's a question of how you paint it, what depth of being you bring to a picture. Okay, let's go to the next one. We'll be seeing a, a, another picture by Edward Hopper called The Mansard Roof. Uh, we won't be able to see it in, in, in great detail probably because the, the picture is relatively small, but a, a watercolor probably painted in the 30s as was the uh, early Sunday morning. But because of the structure, the solidity of it, even though it is a watercolor, and watercolor is thought of to be a, a relatively slight medium, there is a darkness in the windows, there is a presence that one senses Hopper himself poetically present in the building. A certain sense of melancholy, a certain sense of, of looming withdrawal at the same time. It, it raises up as he looks at the top, and yet he's pulling back, as Hopper often does, at reflecting his own personal loneliness. OK, we're going to be going to the next uh, picture here. And we're going to have a picture with a completely different feeling uh, from a completely different time, a painting by Rembrandt, the Polish writer, which is at the, in the Frick Collection here in New York City. 
And uh, this picture can be looked at simply as magnificent painting, as all Rembrandts can. Uh, the magnificent structure of the horse, the gutty handling of the sinews of the legs, the neck, that magnificent skull-like head in terms of the form, the, if we could have it in color, the beautiful browns and golds and yellows and oranges and gray whites and whites and blue whites and so forth, and the total composition, the solidity of the figure related to the horse and so on. But what does this picture symbolize? Does it symbolize anything, or is it just simply magnificent painting? I have the feeling, and you know, compare your feeling with mine, I don't claim to be right in anything I say. I'm just judging by what I feel at the moment and what my experience tells me. You have to judge by what your experience tells you and what your feel of the moment. My feeling tells me is that this is just the opposite of Hopper Cezanne, that little bird hidden in the box by frightened contemporary. Uh, this is youthful boldness personified, not arrogant, not flashy, but totally under control. Look at this posture of the man, the young man. This is youth, you know, the ability to feel that one can handle anything, but not over judging one's capabilities, uh, but not undervaluing them either. Just this total sense of youthful capability, strength, and the ability to do great deeds, to dream great dreams, and at least partially fulfill those dreams. This is Rembrandt. This is not the art of our time, but there may be artists now who are working toward not a false optimism, but working toward expressive strength and reality. Let's go to the next picture. A uh, quick change of gears again, and we see a picture in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum, uh, green oval concept. Maybe we can get keep the Rembrandt out of it there, take it to the right just a little bit. Lynn, can you do that? Just uh, pan to the right a little bit. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> what is this a symbol of? First of all, I don't think it's a, a, an artwork of any significance at all, except that it indicates frustration. You know, art has been so debased in our own time, become so meaningless, that here literally the artist takes his palette knife or a paintbrush handle and stabs his canvas repeatedly. You know, commits a little murder here, and, and it's hung in the museum. It's in the Guggenheim collection. It's absurd, of course. But it has a symbolic quality of a very low level. Uh, indicating frustration, artistic desperation. Let's face it, this is the age where we put chimpanzees on tricycles and strap paint tubes to the wheels and let them squirt their little trails along the canvas on the floor, and we hang it up and we call it an artwork. You know, I mean, why not do this? Okay, we'll go to the next picture. Uh, it's a question of probing reality. It's a question of probing one's own thoughts, one's own feelings, and one ends up with a significant statement. Let's take a look at this other Rembrandt. A portrait of a young Dutch woman uh, pregnant with significance. She's not pregnant, but she is significant. And we look at the expression on the face, the sense of poetical depth and richness of expression. We can talk about the richness of color, the richness of form, the richness of texture, the handling of the lace and all this business. An, an early Rembrandt where there's more detail, but my God, look at the profundity of expression. This is content. This is content. This is symbolism. This is every woman. This is the woman, uh, a human being. This expresses some of the profundity of the human experience. And uh, this is uh, why Rembrandt is so great. It just reeks with richness and expressiveness. Okay, let's, let's go to the next picture. And oh, a Dutch painter of the same time, uh, 17th century, uh, painting by Vermeer. And we look at the a typical Dutch interior, uh, perhaps not typical because Vermeer did it somewhat atypically. And if we pull, let's pull back on the picture. And we think the sleeping woman is the major part of the picture. We think perhaps the still life on the table is of great significance, but let's pull back even farther on the picture so that we can get some of the top of the picture in. 
maybe pan right slightly. You know, get the picture in the center of the camera. Uh, pull back a little bit. Pull back. Pull back a little bit. Pull back. Okay, raise the camera up a little bit. We're going to get this picture. There we go. Vermeer's reveal. And uh, what symbolic qualities does this picture have? You know, in many of the Dutch interiors, the many of the Dutch paintings, there are doorways, there are windows, almost suggesting a desire for escape through those doorways, through those windows. And look at the relationship of this dozing figure. Somehow, that doorway with the black, black painting at the top of the wall through the door, that's why we wanted to flash through. Look how the knob on the chair points to the doorway at the bottom center of the picture there. Look how the map, uh, I don't know what to call it, handle at the upper right corner of the picture points toward the door. Everything in that picture is saying, look at the door, look at the door, look at the door. There's something there about the door. And it's almost as if the woman is asleep. She's dreaming. She's dreaming about the door. She's dreaming about escape from her drudging domestic uh, everyday work. Uh, perhaps it's the, the door is just the equivalent of the mirror. It's the symbol of the unconscious, another part of the, the persona or the person. So keep this in mind. Let's go to the next picture. And we will see in a contemporary American painter, John Koch, K-O-C-H. Interesting how different words are approached. It's not Koch like the mirror. It's Koch, K-O-C-H. What is symbolic about this picture? Seemingly quite re realistic as uh, Koch handles surfaces and textures and light and forms with a great deal of sophistication. But there's a great deal of significance in his pictures. Much like the Dutch, he uses windows and doors to suggest another world. Mo most of Koch's paintings are done within the interior of his studio or his home. And it's almost as if the window is symbolic of escape from the restriction of the studio or the home, or at the same time, perhaps a, th a threat that uh, he he's glad to be in the safety of his home and his beautiful surroundings and his beautiful pictures and sculptures and so forth, but he longs for something of the out of doors. Now, does this picture suggest this? Look at the man sleeping on the couch, dreaming like the figure at the table was, and pointing toward the window, suggesting a relationship, thinking about it, or he's escaping toward it. Look at the dark chair in the foreground, almost a figure, uh, almost an authoritarian dominant figure. Why do I say these things? I don't know. The picture suggests these to me. Say, after 20 years of looking at pictures, uh, pictures have messages. They say things to us. They tell things to us. And uh, they have meaning. Let's go to the next picture. And we'll see another Coke. And ask yourself, what is the picture telling us? Aside from uh, very professional handling of reflection, of form, of composition. He's, he's a master of composition. The man knows what he's doing with the paintbrush. Uh, but he also tells us something about his inner life. He tells us something. Uh, he's making a symbolic statement. Well, we can put it another way. His pictures are rich in content. Look at the chair dominating the picture. This is a dominant, a, 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 a dominant, a symbol of dominance and protrusion the way Cezanne's house was one of recession and retreat. Look at the tiny figure in the background framed by an open window. We have the window again, but this time it, all that is reflected in the mirror. That dark rectangle at the top is a mirror. So that it suggests another level of consciousness, a twist of consciousness in a sense as mirrors do, reflecting the unconscious or the subconscious. Uh, perhaps the way water does. Perhaps that's one of the reasons water is, is of such a fascination to, it, to us. Just to, from a compositional element, look how he repeats the curve of the chair with that dark little curve of a distant chair through a doorway. Look at that mysterious little doorway cracked open, and you see that dark, rather mysterious, rather pregnant curved shape. Uh, somewhat the same scheme of Vermeer's dark picture through the door of his dreaming figure. Okay. 
we're going to go to the next board and uh, with a great deal of, <laughs> how shall I say it, ease of manipulation, we're there. And the next picture is a Picasso called La Vie, Life. And this is an obvious symbolism. It's an intellectual symbolism. I'm not talking about this kind of symbolism. I'm talking about the more poetic, the more unconscious, uh, the more expressive symbolism, the more private symbolism of the artist. Picasso is an intellectual artist. He's not, despite all his passion and so on, and we say, what does this picture tell us? Well, the title, Life, uh, it says perhaps we had best cling together through this veil of tears. Look at the drawing in the background where two figures huddle together. There's one at the bottom where a figure crouches in desolation. And the only way to avoid this desolation, at least part, partly, certainly there's no happiness reeking through this picture. It's during his blue period, around 1906 or so. The woman clings to the man. The man points to his offspring, suggesting the continuity of life. You know, perhaps that's mother-in-law standing next door there. And uh, that's the picture. This is life, this sense of continuity, uh, helping get through some of the uh, pain of it. OK. We'll go directly to Degas at the uh, and a picture called the uh, Bellelli family. I believe they were cousins, relatives of his. And Degas, the realist, the impressionist, the painter of cafes, ballet, racetrack, so forth. What can be symbolic in this picture? What kind of psychological content is in this picture? And we might ask, what is the relationship among the individuals of this family? I could never think so consciously, so intellectually as Degas did here, but then who, who might <laughs> compare myself with Degas, in, at least in that sense, an extremely rational man who has delineated the relationships between these people here and done it in a beautiful painting. You know, you can over-intellectualize and you get a stiff, meaningless picture. So we say to ourselves, which young child is more closely connected to the mother? And which child is somewhat drawn toward the father? And this was the case in real life. Well, the picture tells us. The one girl on the left under the protective covering of the mother with her arm around her, that was mother's girl. There was great discord in the family between father and mother. Look how he separates the father and the mother. There's almost a vertical separation in the picture from the mantelpiece all the way down through the chair leg and the girl's chair leg that separates the father in his own little compartment. The girl in the middle, precariously balanced. Look how he shows only one leg on the girl, the other one uh, under her, seated under her, twisted under her suggesting the fact, oh my gosh, who do I love most, my father or my mother? Eventually, she goes toward the mother. What kind of person is the mother? Authoritarian. Why do we say this? Look at the stiff stance. Look at the, if we could say the expression on the face, very unemotional, very controlled. Look at the shape associated with the mother. Just the way a halo around a, and a person's head suggests holiness, and spirituality, so any object around a person's head suggests the consciousness or the emotional state or the spiritual state of that person. Think of a cartoon in a comic strip where a light bulb goes off by someone's head or a black cloud up there, or a little uh, uh, water bubble bursts, you know, as inspiration comes or whatever. Look what's the shape it around, around the mother's head. Square, rigid, rectangular. The father's character. Can you tell the father's character by the shapes associated with his head? He was a romantic, somewhat ineffectual, uh, somewhat emotional. Look at the irregular dark shapes that seem to clang and bang around his head. Look at him turned away from us so that we, we really seeing him from the back. A fantastic psychological exposition of the characters of this family and the family relationships. And uh, it's this is symbolism. This is content. This is Degas. This is great art. Great art has it. Take care. We'll see you.